right, because that's good to know. Perfect. Okay, good. Okay. So guys, we are going to start chapter five. Welcome everybody aboard. This is chapter five of Tanya, and it's going to be discussing the advantage and the beauty of studying Torah over mitzvot. So let's not use my words, but let's use the author's words. And I'm sharing my screen and let's begin. A further explanation to more fully elucidate the expression of tfisa, which is grasped in the words of Elijah, no thought can grasp you. So Elijah the prophet said, for a compliment to God of how incredible God is and how infinite God is, that no mind of finite intellect can grasp the infinite wisdom and greatness of God. It's just not possible. And I think Stephen Weinstein mentioned that as well about the disconnect between the human species and God, because one we're talking about infinite and one we're talking about finite. And as we even see in the Torah, in the books of Elijah, he says the same thing. So let's continue. When any intellect perceives and understands some intellectual subject, the mind grasps that subject and encompasses it. Let's continue reading just a little bit more and then we'll kind of unpack this a bit. And the subject is grasped and encompassed by and is closed within the intellect that understood and perceived it. So again, there's two things here. When I try to understand a piece, a piece of mathematics or algebra or biology, when any intellect perceives and understands an intellectual subject, the mind, that's me, Mendel Schwartz, my mind grasps this subject and I encompass it. I surround it. And the reverse is true. The subject is grasped and encompassed by the individual. So it's the same thing, but it's coming from which perception? Either you can say, I, Mendel Schwartz, I'm holding on to a cotton ball, or the cotton ball is saying, I, cotton ball, I'm being surrounded by Mendel Schwartz's mind. So both are true. I, Mendel Schwartz, understand that the mathematic or the piece of NASA, the piece of data, or you can say the intellectual property is being enveloped and encompassed by Mendel Schwartz. We're trying to sort of push back on Elijah's statement that nothing can grasp God's infinite. So the Tanya begins with chapter five to state with a little asterisk to Elijah's statement. It's true that with all the meditation in the world and trying to spend 18 hours on the Himalaya mountains to truly grasp and understand God, to that, Elijah the prophet says, I'm sorry, but no finite wisdom can understand the infinite godliness. But chapter five of Tanya is telling us, well, hold on just a moment, because we know that when I'm trying to understand and grasp an intellectual piece of data properly, the subject is, the subject is encompassed by me and I'm completely surrounding that person. So let's see a little bit where it says over here, the subject, which is now within the human intellect. Again, you can fill in the blank, whether it's mathematics, science, NASA, a nice piece of history. It is surrounded and encompassed by that intellect. So my physical brain is encompassing this piece of information, much as a material object is surrounded by the hand that grasps it. So just like my hand is grasping the cotton ball or a tennis ball, so too my brain is completely encompassing and surrounding this piece of data. But the subject can be said to be within the mind only once the mind has fully understood it. Let's just skip to parentheses. Before mastering the subject, however, while the mind is engaged in analyzing its details, the subject is still above the mind. When we say, this is above my pay grade, or it's above my mind. And the relationship between them, the individual and the intellectual property is, is still not quite connected. The mind is within the subject and is encompassed by it. 
So in the Alter Rebbe's words, the author of the Tanya, he's the Alter Rebbe, when you're doing it properly, also the intellect is, in, is closed within the subject at the time of intellectual comprehension and grasping. So my mind is also now, so to speak, being encompassed and, and being enclosed in the mathematics, in the piece of data, in the piece of NASA that I ever, what I was trying to understand. So two things are happening. I'm, in, I'm surrounding the piece of data and my mind is being enclosed in the piece of data. So there's two things happening at the same time. You know, let's continue reading a little bit the Alter Rebbe's words, and then we'll, we'll bring this down to uh, you know, a little bit more planet Earth. So when, for example, one understands and comprehends a particular halacha in the Mishnah or the Gemara, clearly and thoroughly, through strenuous application of his or her mind, his intellect grasps, it should say their intellect, I'm always a little bit touchy-touchy and sensitive with his and her, but again, this was written uh, 100 years ago before I guess women were able to vote. So his intellect grasps and encompasses that halacha. So again, my intellect grasps and encompasses, which means I'm surrounding that halacha, and his intellect is closed within it at a time when I strive to understand it. So again, the halacha, the Jewish, before we, I was giving examples of mathematics or biology, but now we're back to the, the Jewish subject. When I'm trying to understand the piece of halacha, so that piece of data is enclosed in me, I'm encompassing it. And the reverse is true. I'm being enclosed in that piece of halacha. Now, this halacha is the wisdom and the will of God. The rationale underlying the halacha is God's wisdom, and the ruling itself is God's will, as mentioned in chapter 4. It is so, it so arose in his will that if, for example, Reuven, which is, let's say, Bob, would claim thus, and let's say Reuven says, you owe me, or I'd say, Sylvia, you owe me 100 bucks, and Shimon and Sylvia says, such uh, says, uh, excuse me, Mendel, but I only owe you 50. I already paid you back $50. And the halacha says such and such should be the verdict between them. So what, what is the Jewish law? What is, how does Torah view this scenario? If I claim Sylvia owes me $100 and she says, no, I only owe you 50 because I already gave you 50. Or if she says, I don't owe you any money at all because I already gave you the full 100. Or she says, whatever the case is, even if it never did or never will come to pass this type of scenario, that litigation occur over those arguments and claims, yet since it arose thus in God's will and wisdom, that if one person would claim this way, and which is me, and Sylvia claims the other way, the verdict is such and such. This verdict is the will and wisdom of God. Therefore, when one knows and comprehends this verdict as a halakha set forth in the Mishnah or the Talmud, or the halacha codifiers, again, I'm just continuing a little bit more, then he or she then actually comprehends and grasps the will and wisdom of God whom no thought can grasp, nor can any thought grasp his will and wisdom, except when they, God's will and wisdom, clothe themselves in the halachot set before us. Okay, so what does this mean? It means that... We explained in chapter four that if we don't want to be angels because we have souls like angels have souls, chapter four told us that we have something called garments, which is livushim. In last discussion, we spoke about these garments. And these garments are the mitzvot. If I put on tefillin or if you light Shabbat candles, these mitzvot are opportunities and garments that I'm clothing my soul with these wonderful traditions, which we call mitzvot. And thus, I have even a higher connection and relationship with God, even more than the angels, because it's true the angels have souls. But the angels don't have garments. They're unable to do the mitzvah of tefillin or light the Shabbat candles. This is what we explained in chapter four. So there's a wonderful relationship that the human species have with God, Jews and non-Jews, through these livoshim, through these garments, a.k.a. mitzvot. But at the end of the day, there's God who's commanding us to light Shabbat candles or keep Shabbat 
or put on the tefillin or have the mezuzah or whatever the case is. So there's God who's commanding us and there's me, I'm the subject. We're two separate entities. We're two distinct items. And through doing the mitzvah, there's a connection. But that connection is somewhat limited. The same way, if you ask your friend to get me a glass of water and you went and gave that person a glass of water, there's a wonderful relationship where she said, please, and you said, thank you. And, you know, when the person gave you the glass of water or the can of soda, but the relationship is limited to just that very moment, first of all, when you gave the glass of water. And B, it was only a glass of water. I asked you for a favor. God asked me to put on tefillin. I spent 10 minutes and I put the tefillin on. Or he asked you to light the Shabbat candles. You did it. So there's a wonderful relationship. But at the end of the day, all you really used, Sylvia, is your hands to light the Shabbat candles. I'm not minimizing the mitzvah. You took your feet, you walked to the dining room, you had to go to 99, the 99 cent store, whatever it is, buy your candles or the, whatever, wherever you go, a bed, bath, and beyond, whatever the case is. But it's somewhat, I don't want to say an external relationship you had with God, but you, you're not necessarily connecting very deeply. All you're doing really is using your hands. Of course, if you meditate and you get, get all wild and crazy, yes, you have a deeper connection and you pray while you light the Shabbat candles. But in theory, if you chose just to spend nine seconds and light the Shabbat candles, you did the mitzvah and there's a connection. And same thing if I spend 30 seconds putting on tefillin, I did the mitzvah and I'm connected with God. But again, I only use my hand, my right hand, my left hand, and so forth. There's somewhat lacking. So it's important to do the mitzvah. Don't get me wrong. God gave us the commandments. Even if I don't like to do the commandments, even if I don't understand the commandments, I still do the commandments. And by doing the commandments, I have this deep relationship with God. But again, I'm only using my hands, my feet, and things like that. With Torah, I'm now connecting by reading Torah and understanding Torah and truly trying to get to the depth of studying God's Torah, I'm connecting with God in a much deeper way because the Torah is God's wisdom. The Torah is his will. So when he said that if... I'm just meeting you, Maria. Sorry. So when God said if... Uh, a, a Mendel Schwartz bar uh, claims that Sylvia owes 100 bucks, and Sylvia just uh, says, I, I only owe you $50, and we know there's thousands of scenarios in the Talmud. This is the will of God. This is God's wisdom. God thought about these laws and this Torah about tithing and charity and the Ten Commandments and, and everything else involved with Torah, whether it's the biblical Torah or whether it's the Talmud that discusses the laws of Hanukkah and the Talmud that discusses the laws of Purim. And the laws of uh, having an era of a string around to make a private domain on Shabbat, which is more discussed in the Talmud as opposed to the, the Bible. But this is God's will. This is God's Torah. This is God's will. This is his wisdom. And because God's wisdom and will is completely intrinsically connected with God himself. So when we, the Jewish people, study his Torah, we are connecting with God himself. And not just the external part of God where he uttered the words, put on fill and light the Shabbat candles. We're getting to the essence of God. This is the essence of God that was around for billions of years, so to speak, before the world was even created. In the beginning, God said there should be, right, six days of creation, and there's Adam and there's Eve. All that began 5,782 years ago. But God lived forever. We don't understand what forever means because we don't understand what infinite time means. But we, so we, we, we just say God created time 5,782 years ago when he created Adam. So there's no such thing of when my child says, but tell me really, but how many years did God really exist before? So scientists give you a number how many billions of years the sun existed or the trees existed. But as religious people who follow the Torah, Whatever billions of years scientists say the world is existing, as a religious Jew, I can say trilli trillions of years prior to that because God is infinite. So the point is, way before Adam and Eve were born, God's Torah was intrinsically connected with God. So now in 2022, when I'm studying the Torah, whether it's the Bible or the Talmud, I'm connecting with God's wisdom. So back to the beginning of chapter five, when I'm studying truly God's wisdom, like we're doing right now, the Tanya chapter five. 
So my mind is encompassing the piece of data, this intellectual property, and this intellectual property has me, my mind, enclosed in it. So there's this wonderful bond between the intellect and between my brain, between me and this intellectual piece of data, which now we're calling God, because this intellectual data is God's wisdom, is God's intellect. And he and his wisdom, or he and his intellect, is one. So we're connecting in such a unique oneness that can only be done through Torah. And that's why the Jewish law tells us of all the mitzvot, and then you have on one side of the scale, and then you have Torah on the other side of the scale, Jewish law tells us that the Torah surpasses everything. Talmud Torah connected Kulam. To the extent there's questions in the Talmud, that if I'm studying Torah, do I have to stop studying my Torah to uh, go and participate in a funeral? which is a mitzvah to participate in a funeral? Or do I have to stop um, to, uh, to put on tefillin? Or do I have to stop to do this and to do that? Because Torah is so great because you're connecting with God's wisdom and his, comp and his will. So what gives me the right to stop studying and connecting with Torah? So that's why when we talk about mitzvot, we always say that the two greatest mitzvahs is mikvah and sukkah. When I say the greatest mitzvahs, I'm saying it in regards to only one concept. That when you light the Shabbat candles, you're only using your hands or you close your eyes. But when you go into a sukkah, you're completely surrounded by the mitzvah of a sukkah. So you, no one says anymore, well, Trillin, I'm only using my arms. That's true. But if I go into a sukkah for seven days, I'm eating in a sukkah, I'm completely surrounded by the mitzvah of sukkah. But at the end of the day, again, it's only an act. I'm only using my garments, my, maybe my thought, speech, or action. I'm just walking into a sukkah. But I can be in a sukkah, right, and watch Netflix on my iPhone. It's not a crime. It's not a sin. But I'm just showing you that even if I'm completely surrounded by the mitzvah of a sukkah or completely submerged in the water called a mikvah, it could be that my mind is not connected with it. And that's why you can people have people sometimes will have idle chatter or have a sushi party in a sukkah. I'm not knocking it. I think it's a wonderful thing. I do it too. I actually have sushi, sushi in the sukkah for the high center. But there's still somewhat of a, it's lacking a relationship and a connection between Mendel Schwartz, who's eating in a sukkah and doing the mitzvah, and God. There's God and there's me. At that moment, I'm doing a mitzvah, and it's wonderful, but it doesn't come close to where Mendel Schwartz is using his mind, and my, which is my essence, and I'm connecting with the will and wisdom of God through his study. It's always interesting, you know, you talk about, um, you know, the astronauts who are on the spaceships going up to, to outer space and they get all the attention and everyone knows their names, Neil Armstrong and everything else. But the people who are in the boiler room, the engineers putting the spaceship together and putting the space suit together and engineering their launching pad in, in, in Florida or whatever the case is, these people are, are master geniuses. And even those people are only the engineers, but the scientists who explained what is entailed to create the launching pad so that the, that launching pad can actually shoot a spaceship out into outer space. And these math, mathematicians and scientists, they figured out how the orbit system works and how gravity works. And they know the weight of the spaceship and the weight of the astronauts. <laughs> and, 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 and the descent of a, of, a, of a tube landing on the moon and everything else, these people are absolute master geniuses, and they're the ones who are intrinsically connected to this piece of data in such a, such a deep way, even more than the astronauts themselves. It's not to say that the astronauts don't know what they're talking about. We can't take an, an astronaut from City College or barely with a high school degree and send them into a spaceship because he just has to follow the guidelines and the manual. No, obviously we're talking about people who are very smart as astronauts as well. But again, the people who are studying the Torah, the people in the boiler room, 
who are not even yet putting on the tefillin. I like to akin the people putting on tefillin like the astronauts who are in the spaceship. But the people who just take a few steps back, the people who are studying Torah for hours every day or 30 minutes every day or five minutes every day, those are the moments that that individual is connected with the Torah and with God, because God's Torah and he are one, which thus surpasses all the mitzvot combined. And this relationship, this unique bond and interconnectedness only takes place through the Torah. And that's why the Kabbalah always, you can always remember this, if anything from this chapter you get, the Kabbalah always refers to mitzvot as garments, like we explained in chapter four. And the Kabbalah always refers to the Torah as food. Why food? Because just like when I eat food, it goes inside of me and it goes into my blood system and it creates and everything that it, the blood system needs to do for me and my bones and, 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 inter, and, and it interwoves itself through my whole body. And that's why you need even a half a slice of bread is going to completely sustain me, all 160 pounds of me or you know water or whatever the case is. Even though you need garments, you can't live uh, naked out in the outdoors. You're going to get sick with malaria and you're done. But, but e either way, as important clothing is and as important mitzvot are, we still call it a levush, a garment. It's, it, it, it's, 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 mitzvot are, are so important, as we explained, the angels can't do a mitzvah. But we still only call it a garment. Whereas Torah, we call it food because it really connects inside of me because food becomes one with Mendel Swartz. Where after 30 minutes of me eating a slice of bread, you no longer can differentiate if you had a, a microscope and you can look into my blood system, you can't say, oh, yes, that was a half a slice of bread and there's Mendel Swartz in the blood. There's Mendel Schwartz's blood and there's the half a slice of bread. Yeah, maybe if you took a, a pint of blood out from me and you went to the lab, they can see right away, like when we, we get blood results, we get blood tests, they see my white count, my, my red count, uh, you know, if I had coffee in the morning and, and they, they, they could know all of that. But the point is, is that it's completely one with me. You have to only go to a laboratory to, 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 to detect a slice of bread or the cup of coffee. But outside of the laboratory, I need the slice of bread to live. And once I eat the slice of bread, I'm one with the slice of bread or the hamburger or whatever the case is. So Torah is the same thing. Torah is food for the soul. It's food that goes inside of me. It connects inside of me. I connect back within the Torah. And now I'm one chariot connected with God. Because the Torah is his will. Now, if a person doesn't believe the Torah came at Mount Sinai, so that's not the point of the, the discussion tonight. We're not having a theological discussion, does God exist? And we're not having a theological discussion if Mount Sinai really exists. Nor are we having a discussion if the Torah is really from God. Obviously, chapter 5 is, is, is assuming that we believe in God and that the Torah belongs to God. And the Torah was given to us at Mount Sinai. And we're assuming that the Torah didn't begin with Adam and Eve, but the Torah and it, the creation of Adam and Eve was connected with God billions of years ago. It's one with God. So thus, when thousands of years later, we are studying God, we are studying the Torah, we're connected with God, just like the way a slice of bread becomes connected with me. So that is the push of chapter five and, and, and this sort of the angle of first we explain chap, chapter two, which is our, our, our beautiful divine soul. And chapter three was the 10 faculties of Chachma, Bina and Das to connect with God through the intellect and to connect through God through the emotions. That was chapter three. But angels also have souls and angels also have emotions, so to speak. So chapter four explained to us the advantage of these garments called mitzvot, which is used through this divine soul, right? It's not the animal soul in me. It's not the Satan in me that wants to do mitzvah. It's the beautiful divine soul in me and says, now it's time to be a good person and a good Jew, and now it's time to keep Shabbat, or whatever the case is. 
And on top of that, there's something called Torah because now I'm completely connected with God through his, or her, through his Torah. And again, it doesn't mean that we're here tonight to state that I'm imposing on you to study Torah 12 hours a day like when we were once in Yeshiva. We understand that I'm a father, I have six kids, I have to work for a living. But at least we should know that when we do study Torah, we are completely connected with God and his oneness. So that is pretty much it. And we'll keep it at that. Any questions? I'm trying to see who else is on this chat over here. That's it. No, no questions. No problem. We don't have to have questions. Um, we'll leave it at that. And I'll just finish with when we hit 120 and our souls go back to its maker, one of the things God looks at the looks at this soul and he says, Soul, how was it for you on planet Earth over the last 120 years? Obviously, God doesn't have to say it, but he's looking at this soul. He's not looking to see how much money the soul has in the bank account or how much was left in the Roth IRA account. He is looking to see, you know, how honest the person was, the person raised a family. Obviously, these are the, the, the things that God is looking at. But also he's looking at how many garments did I wrap my soul with? How many mitzvot? Because you also have to remember, guys, the godly light in the heaven is a very, very powerful light. Not the light, the sun that God created later. But in the beginning, God created light and he said there should be light and there was light. This light is this atomic, atomic, godly, spiritual, infinite light. So the Kabbalah tells us when our soul goes back up to the heavens, in order for us to appreciate this light, we need to, be in, we need to have these garments. And the more garments we have, the more we can sustain the spiritual light in the heavens. So every piece of garment we layer ourselves with, every mitzvah we do now, it's good to just do it now just for the sake of being good. But also it's a benefit for after 120, it's just a side benefit that we can also sustain, sustain this atomic energy, so to speak, this infinite spiritual beautiful light. And of course, the soul is a much stronger soul with the more nourished we are through the Torah, which we call the food for the soul. So that's the garments and this, the food for the soul. All right. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. That was wonderful. Absolutely. Yes. Rabbi,